Okay, maybe I, I can start at least uh, introduce myself a little bit. Um, my name is Henrik. Uh, I live in Finland, uh, where I currently am also doing this talk, uh, close to Helsinki, in a small town called Järvenpää, uh, which in English means the end of the lake. So it's, uh, of course, one of the many lakes that we have in Finland. Um, I've last spoken at Froscon, I, I think, maybe eight years ago or so. So it's really nice uh, to, to do it again after a while. Uh, I, I currently work at Datastax, uh, where we develop uh, Cassandra database. And I previously worked many years at MongoDB, and before that with both MySQL and MariaDB. So uh, uh, my, my professional interest uh, has been very much targeting open source databases, and, uh, and that's why, uh, why I wanted to do this talk for you. Uh, to look at the different uh, kinds of NoSQL databases that we have. Uh, so uh, let's let's start. Oh, uh, which screen has focus? Now it works. All right. Um, by the way, I'm also in my free time. I, I maintain this uh, project called ImpressJS, uh, which I use to do this presentation. Uh, so it's a, it's a browser-based uh, presentation framework. Uh, all right. So uh, I don't know if it's still the case. Uh, earlier in my career, uh, when I started uh, speaking about MongoDB and, and selling MongoDB, uh, you would often have this discussion that should I use a relational database or should I use NoSQL? And, and maybe some of, uh, uh, some of you might still think uh, that th these are the two options you have. And of course, uh, there are lots of databases to choose from. So then, you know, if you start going through it, uh, I think there are at least 200 or 300. In, in fact, uh, the, the list is so long that the browser runs out of memory in this animation. So uh, uh, the point of this talk uh, is to zoom in a little bit on the uh, NoSQL side though, where it, it turns out that NoSQL is not like one type of database uh, that you can choose to use. So if we look into this category, uh, there are five different categories, or actually there used to be five different categories when I first did this talk. But now, uh, uh, much thanks to success of elastic shirts, for example, I've come to the conclusion that uh, actually we should consider search uh, as its own category uh, because it's uh, it's like quite a big industry already, uh, and it's uh, it has its own uh, use case and, and characteristics. So uh, so then uh, you know if if you can uh, if you can see the NoSQL landscape uh, broken into these six uh, or so categories. Uh, then maybe it's easier to reason that, uh, oh, should I use a key value database or should I use a document database or, or maybe between white column database and so on. So uh, I want to spend uh, the next hour uh, going through uh, the highlights of each of these category, uh, which, which are some of, uh, some of the databases in each category and, and what would you typically do with them, what are the typical use cases and so on. Uh, so hopefully this will help you the next time uh, you need to uh, choose a database for some project. Uh, you will kind of know uh, where to look at uh, when, uh, when you know what your application needs. So let's start with the key value one, which is the most uh, simple uh, also uh, in functionality. And, uh, and really this is kind of where the NoSQL uh, movement started was with memcached. So of course, uh, if we go like 15 years back, uh, most of the internet, it's quite amazing to think now, most of the internet was running with MySQL and PHP, Apache, Linux. So it was the LAMP stack. Uh, but to make uh, MySQL faster, somebody realized that uh, it's, it's good to have a cache between the database and the PHP. Uh, so, uh, so this is how memcached was born. 
and it's a simple key value cache so so you just store objects in memory uh, uh, and and get them with an ID uh, so this uh, this made uh, websites faster back in the day but of course it wasn't the database it was just a cache so uh, if we look at this category today Redis is the clear leader which uh, has some uh, it's it's still uh, very much in memory focused uh, but has some persistent built in so so you can use it for uh, for some use cases at least uh, as a database so uh, why so key value databases I, I think embody the uh, the kind of primary ethos of the NoSQL database which was when we were using only relational databases say look uh, we need much more scale, uh, we, we need them to be faster, and actually they can be simpler, like we are willing to compromise in functionality if we can just get, in, get more speed, more scale, up to, well, maybe then, you know, hundreds of gigabytes. Today, uh, in, in my work, I see customers using hundreds of terabytes or, or even up to a petabyte uh, for, uh, for the database backend powering certain web services. So yeah, so so the key value uh, category takes this to extreme because it's of course extremely simple, uh, and typically uh, these solutions uh, give a good performance. Uh, but uh, yeah, and w when you think about the use case where where we have let's say a relational database uh, as the backend storage and then a cache in front, which you can also use Redis for today. Part of the speed is not that Redis is faster than MySQL, although it is, uh, but part of the speed uh, comes from the data structure. So in a relational database, of course, your data is stored in a normalized form. So it means, uh, you know, the data that you need to show for a single web page, for example, is physically stored in many different tables, many different uh, uh, physical locations on the disk. But typically what you store in a cache is actually the serialized object uh, that you want to show for that web page. So, so you might, might be able, uh, in many cases, to show a single web page or a sim single REST uh, response. Uh, you might be able to store in a single key in, in your key value database. And, and this, this already, like e even if... Uh, if the cache and your relational data was very equally fast, the fact that the, you store data in a different format in the key value database already makes it a lot faster. This is the case also for the next categories, uh, wide, wide column and, and document database. Uh, but, uh, they typically all end up being faster uh, than a relational database, and it's not because they are necessarily a better database in an apple to apple comparison it's because the data structure is is more beneficial uh, for this kind of uh, fast retrieval uh, okay uh, but uh, other reasons uh, why uh, key value databases end up being a fast choice so of course simplicity always is good typically your code code can be smaller and you can focus more on optimizing it when you have less functionality but the other thing, of course, is that these databases are designed to store everything in RAM. So, of course, it's going to be faster than disk, even in the age of SSD. Uh, okay, I already talked about the fact that you typically store denormalized data. It's actually a, a big part of it. Uh, and in a key value database, uh, because they don't support range queries, so, so that is like a, a, a greater than or less than type of query, when you only select uh, individual keys, uh, you can use a hash index, which is a faster index structure uh, than a B3, for example. Uh, and then the same for sharding. Uh, when, you, when you have keys that you can hash, uh, sharding becomes quite simple. So, uh, so this, was, uh, this was early on uh, where you could find uh, good scale-out solutions, let's say 10, 11 years ago, when, when NoSQL databases started spreading. Uh, so, what does it look like? This is uh, an example from Redis. Uh, 
so yeah, you have set and get commands, and there is a key. In this case, first I set the key name, and then I set the key age, and then there is a value which is in quotation marks. Uh, and what is interesting here is that also numbers are in quotation marks. Uh, Redis, uh, yeah, so, so this is the simple case. So then on the client side, you, you would have to convert 43 to a number. So, so in a way, these are just like blobs and, and you could have anything inside the quotation marks. Uh, but uh, there, there is more. Uh, so let's see, uh, what uh, do you use uh, key value stores for? Uh, so, yeah, of course, the original use case has been caching. Uh, there is also, there are also use cases which are kind of caches, uh, but where where your Redis, for example, or, or other caching solution is the primary data store. So it is not, so the data that you put uh, in, in Redis when you use it as a session cache isn't necessarily stored in a more durable way in some other database, like a relational database. Uh, so a session cache is a good example. Uh, depends maybe a little bit uh, on, on the type of site you are in, uh, but uh, let's say, you know, a gaming site or something. Uh, it might be sufficient uh, to have this kind of uh, solution where uh, when I log in to, to the site, uh, my uh, yeah, my, my session key and, and all the data related to my session, where I am. Uh, for example, uh, uh, yeah, th these kind of video recorder applications or streaming applications like, like Netflix, uh, they need to, they, they typically want to remember uh, the, the, lo the position in, in some uh, video that you were watching. So that if, uh, if you take a break, or uh, or if the power goes out, uh, you you can log back in and you can continue watching from uh, from the position where you stopped. So uh, so this is an example of some data that you kind of want to store. Uh, you want to keep the session state, but it's not terrible if the data is lost. So for for this kind of use case, uh, these uh, kind of in memory uh, databases. Uh, pure in memory so, uh, so of course in the case of redis you actually can write to disk but some of the uh, some of these like memcached you can't it might be sufficient because uh, there is a small risk of losing this state so okay uh, in the video example for example it just means i have to start the video from the beginning and find the place where i was but it's not like i lost money or or lost some important data uh, so another case to use uh, these kind of databases is various kind of uh, in-memory computing, low latency computing, maybe machine learning. Uh, yeah, ma uh, different kind of recommendation engines might also fall into this category where the, the, the personalized profile uh, or personalized marketing that is generated uh, can be stored in an in-memory database. If it's lost, uh, we can generate it again from from the source data that was used to uh, to do this recommendation for you. Uh, and uh, one one use case that uh, you you could use uh, these kind of databases for is also queuing. Depends a little bit on your requirements there, uh, but of course uh, it, it could provide good speed. Uh, so one more thing, uh, especially about Redis, is that it actually uh, pro uh, supports more data types than just the this quotation quoted string that I showed in the example. Uh, so you still fetch these objects by key, uh, but uh, the value actually can have some more complex data type such as lists, sets, uh, or maps, and and even streams in the newest uh, uh, newest version of Redis. So, so this uh, this is a good example where even if we have this kind of category that says it's key value, products tend to maybe evolve and, and push the boundaries of this. Okay, let's go to the next category, uh, which is wide column databases. And uh, I would say this has been uh, created by 
Google's Bigtable, but the most popular uh, open source wide column database is Cassandra, so the one I currently work with. And to some extent, uh, DynamoDB, as from a from a user point of view, has similar semantics as this. I'm actually not uh, sure if we know publicly very well what the what is the internal implementation of DynamoDB currently. So, uh, what does a wide column database do? Uh, it it actually looks a lot like a relational database when you first look at it because your data is uh, in tables and the tables have rows and columns. So this means uh, this has more structure uh, than the key value database, uh, you know, because each column could then also have different data types, such as a string or an integer uh, or a decimal and so on. Of course, also like in, in Cassandra's case, for example, you, you again can have maps and lists and, and even your own user-defined types. So all of this sounds like a relational database, but actually uh, in a wide column database, all data access happens through primary key. So, uh, well, in, in the kind of classic case, uh, that's the requirement. So, uh, so in that sense, it's actually similar to a key value database. That you, you need to use the primary key uh, to get your data, uh, then the data you get back actually is in rows and columns. Uh, the primary key can be composite, so uh, in Cassandra you can separately have a column or, or a few columns that is the partition key, and this partition key is then required for, for fast square queries, uh, because uh, if you have a, a large Cassandra cluster, the partition key is and the one that tells you which uh, which server is uh, is this data going to be found on. So if you didn't use a partition key, which uh, Cassandra does allow, uh, it means you would have to send a query to all nodes in your cluster and, and scan all the records in that cluster. And uh, this would, of course, be quite inefficient. So uh, it's the, the point of a white column database is not to do that. In addition to the partition key, you can have uh, then composite primary key. So, so you add more columns that are used as clustering keys. So, so this could be used, say, uh, if my yeah, if my partition key uh, is Henrik, like my name, uh, I could find all users whose name is Henrik, and then with clustering key, I could order them by age or something. Uh, so, uh, so within the partition, you can still do uh, these kind of operations, like uh, like querying on multiple fields or, or sorting or, or others. So uh, it's a bit of a hybrid, uh, somewhere between a key-value database when it comes to uh, to the scale-out functionality, uh, but has some uh, some elements familiar from uh, from relational databases. But it's, it's definitely not a relational database, just to be clear. Uh, even if, uh, if we look at an example, uh, in this is a Cassandra example. Uh, the query language is called Cassandra query language, so CQL. So almost like, like SQL, but not quite. Uh, so you, you create a table, uh, your columns have types, uh, there is an insert statement and the select statement. What is interesting about Cassandra uh, is that actually uh, insert and update uh, are both possible, but they do exactly the same thing. So this is uh, because of the eventual consistency. Uh, so when you do an insert or an update, you cannot assume that so let's say you do uh, after each other both an insert and an update. You cannot assume that these arrive uh, at the data nodes uh, in in that order. So it could also happen that the update arrives first at some node and then the insert. And this is why the internal implementation uh, is such that insert and update essentially do the same thing. Uh, it's just a, a, a write or, or a, uh, it's it's like an upsert actually is, is the name that we often use. 
so uh, what use cases uh, are these databases used for? Uh, from my career, uh, I, I have never seen so large clusters as I see with, uh, with Cassandra users today. Uh, so, uh, I, I mean, I have maybe seen some, but, uh, but in Cassandra this seems to be very common that clusters are 100 terabytes and beyond. Uh, some really big uh, companies might have a petabytes in their Cassandra clusters. Uh, also interesting uh, for Cassandra in particular, uh, the storage engine is write optimized. So, so typically you might use this for, uh, for applications that do quite a lot of writes. Uh, again, uh, you know, like storing ses session state, if you want it to be more durable than in an in-memory database, you could use Cassandra. Uh, and uh, and uh, other similar, uh, also actually this, uh, this use case, and, and by the way, Netflix does use Cassandra. Uh, so uh, for this purpose, so uh, storing, uh, yeah, storing the, the position uh, in a video that you are watching is actually quite, quite right heavy because you need to store it again and again as, as you are watching the video uh, you know you depending on the granularity you want you might want to store the position each second uh, I don't think they do that but uh, you know at least a couple of times a minute you you want to store a, a bookmark uh, so uh, so this uh, requires uh, definitely a write optimized database uh, and the the other uh, interesting feature uh, that these databases have is uh, they, they are well uh, at least Cassandra and Dynamo DB uh, have, uh, have been based. Sorry, this is not true for Dynamo DB anymore. But Cassandra definitely still uses Dynamo uh, protocol for high availability, uh, which again is a write optimized uh, replication protocol. So so even if uh, even if one server crashes, because it's it's a multi-master protocol, so even if one server crashes, th there is no short break when you cannot write uh, to the database. So you can always write data somewhere, uh, and, uh, and this uh, is important. Well, uh, the protocol was invented at Amazon, uh, where uh, the use case has been the, the shopping basket. So, so for them, it was important that uh, if I'm looking at the Amazon website and I wanted to buy a book and I click on the kind of add to basket then this must succeed you know because this is the point where I decide that I want to spend money so it was a very high value uh, write operation to the database that uh, it must not be lost and there must not be like a, you know one second or five second period when the database is doing some kind of failover so you cannot write to it because even in five seconds, they would already lose a lot of money. So, uh, yeah, so, so uh, this is uh, an area uh, I've personally been very interested about and have been have write, written in my blog about the Dynamo protocol, but uh, let's go forward. So, uh, again, uh, you know, pushing the boundaries of what this category definition uh, in the classic sense has been. Uh, so Cassandra 4.0, uh, which, uh, which is now available as beta, actually has uh, invested in a new uh, secondary index type, which should be more useful. So, uh, so also prior versions of Cassandra and, and DynamoDB has had uh, something like a secondary index, but then when you read the documentation, it says that you, you, should, you should only use it for like low granularity data and and data that columns that are not frequently updated and so on. So once uh, once you finish reading this documentation, you come to the conclusion that maybe I'll just use the primary key, which kind of was the idea in the first place. But now uh, this is a really exciting development, I think, in, in the Cassandra world. Uh, uh, in 4.0, uh, more useful secondary indexes and, uh, and actually in, in data stacks, uh, we have a, again a different kind of uh, uh, secondary index implementation which we have contributed to the Apache Foundation to be included in uh, in Cassandra but it's not going to be in 4.0 yet so so this is a, an exciting topic to, to keep
keep an eye on and, and will certainly broaden the, uh, the use cases that you can use Cassandra for. So let me uh, talk about document databases next. And uh, of course, uh, this is an area where I have a lot of experience as well because I worked many years at MongoDB. And, and MongoDB is kind of the leader uh, of this category, or, or not kind of, they, they are very clearly uh, the leader in this category. Uh, but uh, just as another example, I wanted to mention MarkLogic, which is a closed source database. So why am I even mentioning it? Probably many of you haven't even heard about it. Uh, an interesting thing about MarkLogic is that uh, it actually uses XML uh, as its storage format. Uh, so, so both, uh, and MongoDB uses JSON. So both of these are document databases. In terms of features, uh, they do very much the same thing. Uh, and they just use a different syntax. Uh, one uses JSON, one uses XML. But se the semantics user experience is very similar in a different syntax. So the key selling point uh, here uh, is, uh, is the flexible schema. So, so typically, uh, although it's possible, but uh, typically uh, you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't uh, specify a schema like you do in relational databases or like you did uh, in the wide column databases with the create table statement. So, uh, so you can just start inserting uh, data into the database and di different records can have different structures. So, so each of them is a JSON object and they can even be wildly different, but of course, typically uh, it, it makes sense that your, uh, your application stores uh, data that, that where at least they are somewhat similar to each other. And the, the logic here is that, uh, that JSON, for example, in the case, let's focus on, on the case of MongoDB. Uh, JSON, of course, is in itself embeds the structure. So uh, if we look at an example, uh, you know, I, I can insert here a record with, uh, with a JSON object, uh, and I can already see that there are fields, first name, last name, and age, and the two of them are strings, and one is a number. And, and all of this you can just see from, uh, from the JSON syntax. In fact, JSON is, uh, is kind of better than XML in this case. In, in XML, uh, unless I specify a schema, I wouldn't know whether the number 42 here is an integer or a, or a string. But in JSON, uh, there is a, a difference. MongoDB also adds some type like date, uh, which, uh, which don't exist in standard JSON. Uh, but uh, uh, but it's, yeah, it still follows this same flexible c schema model, so, so the date uh, is encoded in the value here, uh, not uh, ju just like an, uh, an integer and string are different. So, so you don't need to specify a, a schema up front. So this can be good or bad, but, but definitely those who like this uh, enjoy the flexibility that they can just start coding and, uh, and iteratively evolve their database rather than uh, needing to specify all of their columns up front. So the, the last point uh, about document databases is that, that they actually allow uh, creation of secondary indexes as well. Uh, so here I, I have created an index, last name and first name. Uh, so this means I could efficiently then query on last name, even if it's not my primary key. In fact, the primary key in this case would be the ID field. So uh, there is something uh, here uh, that document databases have in common with key value databases that each record, uh, even if it has flexible format, uh, still uh, the primary key is an ID and, and the simple use case would still be to, to just fetch these uh, JSON documents with the ID, kind of like a key value database uh, would, would be a, a simple way to use this. So. Uh, uh, what are the use cases for a document database? Uh, so actually, in the NoSQL space, this is the category uh, where, where these are general purpose databases. So yeah, you have, uh, you know, you have records with fields, you can have arbitrarily many, uh, you can have primary key, secondary key, 
so you can do all kinds of uh, you know querying and sorting uh, so so in many cases uh, to some extent uh, these databases or MongoDB competes with relational databases uh, since some years ago also added transaction support and so on uh, so what would be the main selling points to choose this over a relational database so first of all many developers love J using JSON and they you know they might use JavaScript or, or they might use REST uh, APIs in their architecture so it's very natural to also store uh, JSON in the database. Uh, flexible schema uh, can be powerful, uh, can also get you into trouble, uh, but definitely again, uh, you know, if you just want to quickly get going, uh, it, it allows uh, more iterative style of development. And then of course sharding, uh, which uh, if you now look at uh, this presentation, you might say, what is the uh, what is so special about sharding because also wide column and key value databases are good at sharding uh, but compared to relational databases if, if we think about the document database as a general purpose database this is typically the, the a strong selling point because even today in 2020 uh, most of our classic relational databases are not so great with sharding like, like MySQL and Postgres um so then when you think about what use cases uh they are used for uh you should think about uh, uh you should think about these uh uh points in in the previous point that uh, uh what would for example be useful for where, where would the database with a flexible schema be a strength so so one application could be something like a data hub which is kind of like a data lake, but more more operational uh, and, and more of a classic database. And the point with the data hub is uh, is that you aggregate data from many source databases. Uh, so kind of like a data warehouse, but the difference with data warehouse is that uh, in a document database, you wouldn't spend time designing a star schema, which might quickly become complicated if, if your data warehouse has multiple different data sources that each have different kind of data so how do you how do you get all of these different uh, source databases stored in the same data warehouse uh, it would require a lot of planning uh, how, how you design the columns and data types and and also these source databases might evolve and change all the time so a database an OSQL database with flexible schema uh, has has a strong advantage here because uh, if two source databases are different and also if they are different over time uh, then you can just continue inserting them into your data hub because uh, there, there is no schema that would prevent you from doing so so now of course uh, this is not like a magic solution uh, uh, that uh, uh, everything is now very easy uh, so the difference between a, a relational database now is Yes, we, uh, we could easily insert data into the database, but it might be more difficult to query uh, because all the records are not the same. So if we, yeah, if we want to search you know, by first name and last name, for example, there might be also records there uh, that don't have those fields. They might have the name in some, yeah, in just a field called name. Uh, and so it's a bit of a mess. Uh, and and that's but it's the strategy here is to postpone the problem so so instead of being difficult to get data into your data warehouse in the first place it's a bit more difficult to to read it out uh, so uh, in this uh, category what what is there more I, I actually struggle to think about it because in with MongoDB for example for a long time it was missing transactions now it has it. Uh, it also has like views and, and other things. So I, I think actually this is a fairly mature category and uh, and a lot of future development will be more incremental innovation such as just better performance or some better tools uh, for analytics uh, or integrations with, uh, with other technologies and so on. Okay. 
So, uh, graph category. Neo4j, of course, is the leader in this category and have, uh, I would say, pioneered a lot of it. Uh, I, because uh, of some specific features, I added as a second option just uh, our own product, Datastax Enterprise, which, uh, which embeds uh, Apache Tinkerpop uh, project for, for a graph query language. So, uh, what do you do with graph databases? Uh, so, in a graph database, obviously the data structure is a graph. So, the records are nodes, uh, and nodes are connected by edges. And in fact, both of them can have, can have properties. So, if, if you do that, then the edges start looking like records as well. But typically, you, you think about the, the nodes as the main records, and then the edges are, are what join them together, if, to, to use a relational term. And of course, to, to do efficient queries, you also need to use indexes uh, here, just like in the document database or relational database. So what does it look like? So uh, because it's uh, a bit simpler, uh, I actually used uh, now the, the data stacks example, which uses the Gremlin, Gremlin language from, from Tinkergraph project. and. Uh, uh, here, yeah, so, so there is some initialization here to create a, like a graph session, uh, uh, but then on the bottom, uh, on the bottom there you can see, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, uh, this query where we query for a, a vertex, so which is a node, uh, where, where the name property is Marco, uh, and then there is an out edge. Uh, so he, he knows uh, some other people and we want to output their name and, and in this case it finds two, uh, two other people that Marco knows are Vadas and Josh. So this was a very simple uh, graph query. It's almost like we could have done this also with a join uh, in a relational database. Uh, but why I wanted to show this example just is this, uh, uh, this fluent syntax where you have like a dot and a an function and then a dot and another function so for complex graph queries I, I personally like this gremlin uh, gremlin approach of, of using a fluent syntax uh, because it's, it's kind of easy to read uh, as you traverse the graph it, uh, it makes sense to me so what uh, do we use graph databases for so often and, and especially in the case of Neo4j uh, these are used for analytics. So, uh, uh, so you have some data set, uh, which is a graph, then you put them in the graph databases and, and then you do these queries like, yeah, I want to find all of the friends of, of my friends who own a cat, for example. Uh, this has also been used, by the way, uh, in, in some of these journalistic cases where uh, in, in the Panama Papers, for example, I, I believe they use Neo4j because they wanted to find connections that, uh, you know, what if, if Putin has uh, hidden his money in Panama, uh, who, who are they connected to and which lawyer and, and which other, uh, which other uh, people uh, were connected to this bank account. So, so you, you traverse this kind of network to, to understand uh, we, yeah, the, the network of shell companies where, uh, where they hide their money. Uh, of course, uh, any social media uh, is a network, so, so this alone explains why this is a meaningful category. There, is a, there are a lot of data sets today which are graphs. Uh, you can also use it a lot for, for recommendation engines and so on, uh, because again, recommendation engines often follow this kind of logic that, uh, you know, yeah, Amazon is, was early on famous for this recommendation that there are some other customers who bought this book and they also bought some other book. So this is actually a, a graph query. And when we talk about analytics, uh, this is uh, used a lot in national security. If you remember the, uh, the Snow Edward Snowden revelations, uh, you know, the, the typical case there is that which person called which other person with their mobile phone. So again, it's a graph query. Um, so, 
what does the future look like for graph queries? Uh, an interesting observation here is that there are many uh, different graph query languages. So I showed you Gremlin, which we use at Datastax. Uh, Neo4j has developed one called Cypher, which is completely different and it, it kind of looks like ASCII art, even where you draw arrows in different directions. Uh, and now what is becoming popular is GraphQL from Facebook, which is like kind of like a REST API, but more like a graph. Uh, it's, a, it's an interesting combination there. So, uh, so an interesting question from, for the future is, will there be one standard language? Cu currently, maybe GraphQL seems to be the most popular one. Uh, but uh, it has, I think it has some limitations for really advanced graph analytics. So it's, it's more maybe targeting uh, uh, operational applications. Uh, okay. Uh, and uh, I said that uh, graph is mostly used for analytics. And, and in case of Neo4j, for example, I would say their database uh, is the internal architecture is definitely more optimal for for read queries or analytical queries and i it's used for op operational applications i'm not sure if it's if it's very optimal for that uh, in data stacks our graph database is a bit more optimized for uh, for oltp because it is running on top of cassandra uh, which of course is uh, is very much an oltp database uh, an interesting un so sharding in general is uh, is a difficult problem now for a graph. So in the case of uh, of our product, for example, that uh, is essentially Apache Tinkerpop combined with Cassandra. Uh, yeah, the, we store the graph uh, as Cassandra records uh, that where you then have this partition key, and and then uh, the partitions are sharded over over a large cluster so it's possible but uh, but this is still uh, kind of a hash based sharding so so all uh, uh, all of the records in the graph are equal and they're just spread out uh, based on hash consistent hashing so an interesting unsolved problem i think and unsolved in the sense that the product would actually set, exist that you can buy and use uh, would be how to do optimal sharding for a graph database. So this means, uh, you know, in this, if you, yeah, if you think about like a social media graph, for example, uh, I have some friends, maybe some hundred of them in, in this data set. Uh, so queries starting with me, uh, of course, are likely to traverse to my friends and friends of friends. Uh, so an optimal sharding would mean that uh, nearby nodes that are likely to be accessed in the same query would also be stored in the same shard and in the same uh, disk page. And uh, this is not how any of these graph databases uh, that I mentioned actually work to get today. So, so they more uh, access all data equally. So in the case of Neo4j, for example, you, you typically want your active data to be in RAM uh, after, in which case, of course, uh, everything can be accessed. Like e each hop can be made in constant time. Okay, uh, query engine, uh, I used to call this category Hadoop many years ago, but in reality, uh, what people use today is Spark, which has more or less replaced Hadoop. Uh, and we shouldn't forget Presto, uh, which, uh, which is actually powering uh, Amazon Athena, so it's used quite a lot. Uh, Presto was, uh, was published by Facebook. Uh, so now if uh, if you talk to some analysts or, or other people with opinions they would say that this category doesn't belong in this talk at all because they are not no sql databases because they are not databases so this is actually true they are query engines so uh, uh, so spark and presto uh, will query data that is stored somewhere so uh, in, in the Hadoop case, of course, it used to be Hadoop file system, but today maybe the most common place to store data is in S3 in Amazon. 
and it could even as a use case be that you have just stored data in S3 like uh, log files or something and then later on you realize that hmm maybe I should analyze something in these log files uh, to understand my, my users better uh, and then you can just put Spark or Presto on top uh, and, and start analyzing your data. But uh, you could uh, also use databases as a data source, so both Cassandra and MongoDB, for example, have a, have a Spark connector. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, and these are definitely, uh, oh, sorry, use cases come later. So uh, to go to go back uh, so so definitely uh, these are used for batch queries so so not uh, not OLTB databases uh, you know because like I said typically the data already exists in files for example in S3 so so these are just used for uh, for read queries for for analytical queries and sometimes can be really long-running queries as well uh, if, if you have lots of data. So here is uh, what it looks like in, in Spark. Uh, so uh, actually there is a, a lot of code here to, to create a Spark session. So th this is actually like a, a shell. This is not a programming language, but the shell uses uh, Scala, I believe this is. Uh, so so you, even in the shell you then create a session uh, and, and you have to, to create uh, what in Spark is called a data frame, so you you uh, yeah you have to connect your data, create a data frame that maps to a file in this case a JSON file, uh, and then out of this data frame you can create a view which you can query with SQL. So so after you have done those first lines, uh, then you can actually use uh, use something that is familiar SQL, and uh, in my experience. Uh, for analytics, uh, like uh, in in companies, the people that want to do uh, business intelligence, they they actually like SQL because they have learned it a long time ago, they, and it's their standard, and and they prefer it over learning some other language, such as uh, in, in MongoDB's case, for example, uh, the language is completely different. So for developers, that was usually. Uh, okay, uh, but for the people who want to do analytics, they definitely wanted SQL. Okay, uh, so what are the use cases? Well, uh, this is the category where we speak about data lakes, uh, which used to be a Hadoop thing, but today, uh, you know, if it's just S3, I think if, if you have data in S3, maybe people don't call it a data lake anymore. Uh, so what would you do? Well, uh, analytics, machine learning, is used for a lot of things nowadays. So all kinds of personalization, fraud detection, again, national security. But uh, then in the end, you know, it might just be re classic reporting, uh, just like uh, old school data warehouses. At the end of the month, you want to provide some kind of report or maybe like a la uh, live dashboard. So it's not at the end of the month anymore, but, um, but it has to be uh, uh, constantly updated. Uh, yeah, uh, this this is uh, mo the modern version of a classic data warehouse, I would say. Uh, Spark uh, also has a streaming version, which is interesting. So, uh, real-time processing of data that is happening currently or that arrived from some uh, some place uh, now. Uh, but the Spark streaming version is really, it's still batch queries, it, it's just a very small batch of the recent data. Uh, but it's nice, uh, it, it allows you to, to use the same interface and same SQL queries uh, on a real-time stream. And I, I guess I already mentioned uh, Amazon's Athena is based on Presto. And then uh, for search. And uh, the crown jewels here is really the Apache Lucene project, uh, which uh, then is used in Solar, uh, which is a, you know, a server. Uh, and Lucene is the engine uh, that, uh, that stores the data and indexes the data. But uh, now uh, I would say the market leader has become Elastic, uh, which uh, 
which is a younger product compared to this. And also Elastic uh, embeds is, is based on Lucene as a data engine. So, so in both cases, uh, Lucene is the real, real winner here, really valuable Apache project. So uh, what does a search engine do? Well, you can search for words. So in, in all the other databases that I showed, you search for fields. So if you want, if you have a name, like Hendrik Ingo, if you want to search only for the last name, typically it means you have to store the last name in a separate field, first name in a separate field. But with text search, uh, you can have a body of text that in a database would be stored as a single field, but the search engine, Lucene, will actually index each word separately so that you can search for individual words uh, and, and maybe even like some, some wildcard patterns and so on. And you can get uh, results uh, ranked. So if you search for multiple words, uh, if, if some record matches all of those words, or if, let's say, all of those words are in the title rather than in the end of some long text, and then it gets more points and it gets higher up in, in the results. Uh, and you can do uh, faceting uh, or, or highlighting. Uh, with, so basically, these are things uh, th this is kind of like an indexing use case, but it's more complicated than you typically do with uh, the B3s in relational databases. Okay, uh, so what does it look like? Uh, this is the Elastic Search example. So it's actually a REST API with uh, JSON records. Possibly this is already one reason why it became so popular. Um, so in, in the first row there, uh, we post, uh, that is, we, we insert in REST terminology, uh, uh, one, uh, one record. And notice here now that the name is in a single field. Uh, and then in the second row, second query, we use get. So, so this is a query. And we search only for my last name. Uh, but because uh, Elastic has indexed each word separately, it actually do, does find this uh, record. And in the result set there and the, in the bottom, uh, you can see that uh, uh, it's not just the, the name that is returned, but, uh, but actually we have also, uh, uh, we, there is also like uh, the index name, which in other databases would be called the table, but in the search in engine focuses on the index, so called Froscon here. And, uh, uh, so sorry, in the index would be maybe like uh, what other databases call the database. And then maybe the type uh, of record uh, would be in people. And then the ID uh, of the record here is ID1. And this is because in the first row I, I used Froscon and people and ID1 in, in the rest URL. So uh, what are the use cases? Uh, uh, well, uh, one is a search engine. So, so if you want a search box for your website, kind of like a mini Google, uh, then uh, this is uh, these are the products you use. Uh, but uh, yeah, also uh, some other complicated queries that uh, typical uh, relational database or document database B3 doesn't cover. Uh, and then Elastic has this product suite called Kibana, which is like an analytics uh, solution. So uh, for log files, for example, you can use it uh, for the same purpose as Splunk. So you have some text data, you put it in Elastic, and then uh, you can immediately see, for example, word frequencies uh, or, or search for uh, errors and so on. Uh, kind of out of the box, it, it comes very easily uh, from, uh, from this uh, search uh, e engine. Uh, su supplies it so, so you don't need to like you don't you don't need to spend a lot of effort creating specific indexes or so on because uh, you can just index all all the words uh, and uh, well log files is one thing but actually security monitoring then uh, for example monitoring your firewalls or networks or so on or or physical uh, and and I don't know why, probably national security again uh, is uh, using these kind of solutions. So those were the categories. Uh, 
And yes, so so just to and one reason I started taking this seriously as well. Elastic is uh, is actually one of the biggest companies in the NoSQL space. Uh, it, it's uh, it's younger than MongoDB, but uh, uh, at least in some point already had higher valuation even than MongoDB. Uh, so uh, uh, both of them are public companies. So this is why we know. Uh, so so it's it's definitely a big thing and, and growing fast. So those were the, the technical details of all of them. Uh, I, I also wanted in the end to, to say a few words. And if, if this is like too much information on, on a single page, uh, don't worry. Uh, but uh, in uh, two, two years ago, there were a lot of uh, discussion in the database space uh, where a lot of these products change licenses. Uh, and uh, uh, and well, they uh, I think mostly in reaction to uh, to Amazon uh, uh, taking some of these open source databases and offering them as a service on the Amazon cloud, and, and of course Microsoft, Google uh, do the same to some extent, uh, which is what they do, uh, and some of these companies felt that that was a threat to them. So many of them changed licenses. Uh, and as you can see, the, the trend is to the right. So uh, so they, uh, yeah, they moved from a more open licensing to a more closed licensing. Uh, but, uh, oh, in the case of Redis, the, yeah, Redis moved actually to the right and then came a little bit back to the left. Uh, but uh, I, I should also point out this is a simplified table. So many of these pro products actually have more than more than a single edition, like a community edition and enterprise edition, and, and often something more even. Uh, so uh, this is just to get a picture of which of these changed. Uh, on the last row, it's an interesting uh, development. So Elastic uh, didn't change as such. Well, Elastic also changed. Uh, they always had some uh, some closed source components, but uh, uh, yeah, but they changed uh, architecturally how they store them in the repository. In the response to this, Amazon actually launched the open distro for Elasticsearch. So uh, so in this case, it's actually uh, where yeah. So uh, so for example, some. Uh, authentication security related features uh, which are only available commercially in Elasticsearch Amazon of course wanted to develop and they have open sourced them for, for their own use so so in this case it's actually the opposite from uh, from what the discussion was in 2018 so so Amazon actually had a, has the more open source version compared to Elasticsearch so uh, on the other hand uh, you can see many of these didn't change uh, one thing you can of course see that uh, those projects that are governed by the Apache Foundation, for example, cannot change the license. They will always have uh, they they will always have uh, uh, Apache license because that's the only possibility for the Apache Foundation. All right, uh, that was all, and uh, I see there are some questions, so uh, maybe I will take this image and uh, yeah, uh, we have a few minutes for questions where would you put influx DB uh, so I saw a, a little bit of, of the talk but not uh, I don't know if there was some architectural explanation in the beginning I missed it uh, but I, I think generally uh, uh, there are there is a class of databases which are so-called time series databases and and there are various techniques uh, various techniques that uh, where you store data uh, so that it's efficient to query large amount of data and also compress on disk uh, when when if you know ahead of time that uh, that they are ordered by a timestamp for example or, or could be other uh, other similar use cases as well so so in a way 
it is like a data warehouse, but it's not, uh, you know, it's not the same as doing a star scheme on Oracle or, or Postgres. Uh, it's uh, the performance difference can be huge, like several tens or tens of times. Uh, and then, of course, often they might have some uh, some sharding or or parallelism as well. So, so I I would, uh, yeah, I would maybe call it as a separate category time series databases, uh, and could that be like a seventh category in this presentation? Uh, maybe, but it's not. Uh, the time series databases, from a user experience point of view, is not that different from a relational data. So typically, you use SQL. And, and then it's just faster, and, and you can store more data. Uh, so, so it's somewhere between. Some sometimes, uh, many years ago, somebody proposed that there should be a like a category called new SQL because it was between traditional relational databases and and then no SQL databases, which were very different. And where would you place Apache Ignite? I'm I think I'm have forgotten uh, what Apache Ignite does. I'm sorry. Uh, if you want to expand in the chat, you can. Uh, and there weren't any more questions, so I, I will just have to wait. Um, what do you think, Rafael? Uh, are there more questions, or should we start to wrap up? Um, yeah, feel free for more questions in the chat. And we have uh, still some time for them. Yeah. Ah, okay. Distributed in-memory key value store with SQL on top. Yeah, I see. Uh, ah, yes. Uh, yes, and there, there are others. Uh, yeah, there, there are others with this kind of combination as well. So, uh, okay, I think you answered your own question very well. Distributed in-memory key value store. SQL on top. One, uh, this reminds me of, of one category uh, I was also thinking when authoring this presentation. Uh, there is a class of, uh, of distributed databases like Google Spanner, uh, CockroachDB, uh, FaunaDB, which all try to be like uh, present the SQL interface to the user and, and try to uh, match what uh, what the good old relational databases do in terms of supporting transactions uh, OLTP and and providing a very high level of consistency so so many NoSQL databases had this uh, concept of eventual consistency uh, where yeah where you use various techniques to deal with the fact that uh, data arrives at different times uh, in, in different servers so so I in this presentation, I, I mentioned in the wide column database case, inserts and updates are actually both upserts because you don't, they might arrive out of order in that architecture. So, uh, so yeah, so, so these uh, newer uh, distributed databases typically try to provide a, uh, a higher level of consistency so that they are distributed uh, in their internal architecture, but, uh, but would actually be more similar to to classic relational databases in the user experience, and that's uh, this this category. I think is quite interesting from uh, for people like me who are interested in in database internals. So I, I try to read up on them, but at the same time, I, I think they are still a bit uh, uh, the, the category is still quite small and, and growing. So it's interesting to see where it's it's going in the future. Okay, should the consumption of memory and CPU see it as an important aspect to different the database systems? Uh, yes. Uh, so, uh, performance uh, is an interesting question, and, and often uh, you do trade offs in many, uh, in many directions. Uh, so, we, for example, I, I mentioned that some of these databases are write optimized. This means uh, then when you read the data back, actually there is more work. Um, when when you have in-memory databases or data, well, I, I mentioned Redis as an example of a, 
in memory or, or memory oriented database. Uh, but also, like I mentioned, some databases like Neo4j, I, I think, uh, work optimally when the data fits in memory. Uh, so this is, of course, a, a choice for you. Uh, probably your queries will be faster, but, uh, but the uh, architecture is also more expensive because RAM is expensive. So, uh, so then some other, uh, other databases, in this case, uh, then maybe like Cassandra and MongoDB are more disk oriented, so similar to, to typical relational databases. So you can have decent performance even if a lot of your data is not in RAM. Uh, and then, of course, at the other extreme, you have Spark, which uh, which can read huge amounts of of data uh, that that resides on disk and, and is so-called cold data. And but then Spark uh, Spark again is a or all of these query engines typical is a good example of something where they typically consume quite a lot of CPU uh, because the data might not be indexed, for example. So so uh, yeah. Uh, memory consumption, CPU consumption, and, and by the way, also disk consumption. So I, I think the uh, influx, question with InfluxDB and the time series databases typically achieve very high compression ratio uh, because they can use uh, co a columnar database uh, storage model can, can use different kinds of compression like run length encoding. Uh, so then uh, database might use more or less disk as well. Uh, it's it's kind of a space inside which you optimize, and, and it always depends on your application and what kind of data you have. So, uh, yeah, okay, I think there was a comment there, low, low for NoSQL, high for relational. Uh, ah, yes, okay. Yes, good point. So I, I, th yeah, I think in the beginning I, I mentioned this as well, that in, in many uh, ma in many NoSQL databases, they might actually be more efficient than doing the same thing in a relational database because the data is stored as an object, for example, in a key value database or as a denormalized document in a document database. And, and same also with, uh, with Cassandra, actually, uh, typically uh, a partition uh, will store data, more data together, so in, again in a denormalized way. Um, another question about NoSQL data protection. Uh, I, assume, I want, this could mean two things now, either uh, you, you are referring to like security features or durability, which means that uh, that your data is safe on disk. Uh, so if we speak about the latter, it is true that originally, of course, NoSQL databases, the products were new and immature, let's say 10 years ago. And uh, MongoDB, for example, still suffers from this reputation. I, I would say my current database, Cassandra, never had such a reputation. Uh, in, in fact, in the relational database world, I, I would say MySQL and Postgres have, have a similar uh, similar uh, difference. Uh, okay, so so let's talk about security instead. Uh, it's uh, it's different. Uh, so, but I, I think uh, uh, security. So, so having different users, having different permissions for users, is something that has evolved. I would say today, uh, actually, uh, today actually. If I think about Redis, Cassandra, MongoDB, all of them are are fairly close or, or equal to the relational database world. I I I would say security nowadays is quite good with NoSQL databases. But but this is again, you know, we we started ten years ago with uh, with simple databases that were focused on scaling and didn't have many other features and, and uh, yeah, user authentication and security features was definitely one of them that were developed over time. But, but today, I, I would say situation is good. Acid compliance, uh, most so so this is a uh, this is another interesting topic. Uh, is uh, uh, in relational databases we talk about acid compliance when 
wh when we want to say a, a database is good. So, so when I write the data to the database, it's it's safely durable on disk, uh, and there is some consistency and, and atomicity and isolation, so that the yeah, so my queries and user experience are I what I would intuitively expect to, to experience. Uh, and it's yeah already for a relational database there was like decades of research uh, to, to get to the point where we are today with uh, with isolation levels but with distributed databases this is like a whole new so in the uh, whole new area so in in the SQL standard you have uh, four isolation levels and then there is also uh, many uh, many relational databases support uh, snapshot isolation which is not in the standard so so then you have like five uh, but with distributed database you have like 15 or 20 different isolation levels and some of them can be uh, very low uh, because if you yeah if you insert data here on one server and then you send a query and it goes to another server uh, so uh, so then you know the data that you just inserted isn't there and from a application or user point of view it might uh, it might create situations that are unintuitive so for example as an application if i post something on a social media site uh, and and then i yeah then i reload the page i would expect my post to be there but it, in a distributed system it could actually happen that uh, you know my my post that i just sent isn't actually there and i can't see it but five seconds later I can um, so this is like uh, you know how like, could even if we sp had a lecture of another hour uh, it would still only be a small introduction to this area I, I actually have such a presentation as well uh, but uh, but for example I mentioned uh, the dynamo protocol uh, or di dynamo high availability uh, in this presentation which I think is a, for me has been a really inspirational uh, paper at the time and uh, uh, and it's it's a very smart solution where internally a Cassandra cluster for example using Dynamo internally there is this eventual consistency so uh, uh, re uh, data updates arrive uh, at different times on different servers but using the Dynamo protocol, you can then also issue reads in a way that compensates for this, so that, yeah, if, if you specify then certain consistency levels in the Dynamo protocol, uh, then you can actually uh, have a consistent experience. So, so it means that you can read. If you write something, you can also read it back, and it's guaranteed to come back or, or fail uh, if, you, if you cannot guarantee that. So very interesting area. Um, Okay, thank you. Uh, um, I, I enjoy the questions. It's uh, usually better than the uh, than the actual slides, so it's it's good that you are active on the chat. Encryption at rest, uh, I think, also belongs under the security heading, and I didn't mention it. Uh, I I have to apologize now. This is an open source conference. I don't remember if uh, Cassandra has it. We we definitely offer it at data stacks in our. Uh, commercial version of Cassandra, uh, MongoDB, uh, or in MongoDB, I think it's also only in the commercial version. Uh, but I wonder if Percona has an open source version of encryption at rest for MongoDB. So you can ask Peter Zaitsev, who is after me in this same uh, Heresal. Uh, I don't know. I, I imagine Neo4j might have it as well because their customer base is security conscious. Uh, and I also don't know about Redis. Security in databases is top priority. Uh, it is. Uh, it depends a little bit on your customer base, but of course in Europe, uh, of course we have also European Union that sets the bar quite high. Uh, in uh, so. Uh, encryption at rest, for example, is often required for for uh, user data, so that you, you guarantee a certain le level of data protection for uh, for data that has privacy implications. So, so I, I totally agree, uh, and it's uh, 
it's again a, a, a big topic that could be a lecture of its own. Okay, are there any questions left? Okay, uh, yeah, the, okay, Hans has more uh, comments about the database breaches. I, I think we will have to find, uh, you know, maybe we can go to the Innenhof or something to continue this discussion uh, in a separate channel. And there is another uh, new, useful presentation for uh, new no skill newbies as me so so I, I'm glad uh, the, yeah this uh, this is hopefully a useful framework that you can use when you look at no SQL uh, databases I'm, I'm glad you find it useful